In the biblical story of the handwriting on the wall, uh, you know, everybody could see that handwriting. The king, Belshazzar, could see it clearly enough. Trouble was, he couldn't tell what it meant. If you recall, he had to call in an interpreter. A lot of people can see handwriting on the wall. The argument is, what does it mean? The thing that makes reading that handwriting on the wall so difficult many times is that the message is one we don't want. That we don't want to be able to read. Many times when a man's faced with a problem that he can't solve, he doesn't want to admit that it's an absolute limitation that cannot be broken. Then the grand old art of buck passing comes in. That's when you start saying, well, it isn't my fault. He won't let me. Let's consider a situation of that type. My name is Lester McClellan, Secretary General of the United Nations. It was a busy day in the year 2180. The ambassador from the now independent colony on Venus was due to see me that morning. And there was a note on my desk requesting me to call Dr. Kingston, head of the UN Research Bureau, as soon as I had a chance. Kingston was working on a project vital to the future of mankind. I decided to call him. Bernie, I got your message. What goes? Good news about the space drive project. There's been a substantial breakthrough. We've made a qualitative advance. And what does that mean in plain English? <laughs> that we'll be finished with the groundwork in less than a year. Maybe even next month. Uh, have you prepared a news release on this thing? Uh, not yet, Lester. We're waiting for official approval first. Uh, look, uh, can you come down to the lab sometime today? I can give you a briefing on the new material. Fill you in. I'll try, but I'm not promising. The ambassador from Venus is due any minute, and you know what a tough job I'm going to have with him. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Well, Lester, if you're free at all... I'll uh, call you back if I am. Right. Good luck with the ambassador. Thanks. Oh, he's coming now. I can't talk anymore. Try to see me later, will you? Bye, Bernie. Uh, Secretary General McClellan, I'm David Rockwood, Art Secretary of Venus Central Council. How do you do? Uh, won't you be seated, Mr. Rockwood? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you back to the planet of your ancestors. Is this your first visit to Earth? It is. I wish I could hope that you'll enjoy your stay here, but I can't do that, can I? <laughs> mm. Anyway, we're very happy that the Outworlds agreed to send an observer to the Earth. We have a major problem here, Mr. Rockwood. We think your worlds can help us. Of course, you're familiar with the text of the General Assembly resolution. Of course. The three governments of the former Earth colonies of Mars, Venus, and Callisto have sent me as their representative. The space travel is not cheap, you know. We saw no need of three observers when one would do. Uh, yes. Yes, I, I see. Um, I've arranged for you to have a brief guided tour of parts of the Earth to illustrate our population problem. Oh, very well. Uh, we've agreed to reserve decision until we've seen Earth. Uh, we can begin our tour now, if you like. And this is the Bureau of Population Statistics. Now, you see that screen over there, Mr. Rockwood, the one with the red numbers on it? Mm -hmm. It's the up-to-date record on Earth's population. Every birth and death is automatically fed into the main computer channel as soon as it's known, and within an hour, it's registered up there. Thirteen billion seven hundred and sixty two million three hundred and twelve thousand <laughs> the last column doesn't stay still long enough for me to read it uh, no it doesn't we average half a million new earthmen a day and the computer has to move fast to keep up <laughs> it's an average gain of three or four million people a week 150 million a year and the figure keeps rising <laughs> what you need is a really efficient play something to clear away three or four billions <laughs> I don't find that very amusing, Mr. Rockwood. An interplanetary war would achieve the same thing. Shall we move on? Down there, you see New York City. Population, 15 and a half million. Incredible. One long stretch of buildings. Well, the largest city on Venus has only 200,000 people. I can remember when we still had trees in New York. <laughs> Not anymore. Wood is a luxury on Earth now. And so is living space. 
Where do you expect to put the billions you're figuring on in coming years, hmm? I wish I knew. We're converting Mars and Venus and Callisto into livable worlds, but the rest of the planets are impossible to convert. We need population relief in a hurry. Meaning emigration to Venus, Mars, and Callisto, hmm? Yes. If... If you'll permit us to send more settlers to the planets we built and colonized. Oh, come now. Do you really think we owe you the right to send the overflow to us? Let's finish the tour. We can discuss possible arrangements later. <laughs> the handwriting doesn't have to be on a wall. Sometimes it can be on the face of a computer, as it was this time. But the handwriting was there. But now, uh, what is the meaning of this handwriting? Does it mean the colonists should allow Earthmen to move out? Or does it maybe have some other meaning? And this is food station 117, an artificial island in the Gulf of Mexico. Since we've hardly any open land on Earth for cultivation, we've turned to farming the sea. We've developed some new foods. These are plankton steaks, synthesized from small sea creatures, microscopic crustaceans. Mm -hmm. And this bread comes from plankton flour. Taste it. Mm. Oh, dear. <coughs> Not very tasty stuff, is it? No, it isn't. But half of Earth's population knows no other food. It's nutritious, and the supply is practically limitless. And we can't spare land for grazing animals. The only ones left are in the zoo. Uh, care for another slice of steak? Uh, uh, no, thanks. No, thanks. This one will do very <coughs> well. Oh, uh, may I have something to drink, please, to wash away that taste? How did you enjoy the rush hour subway ride? It was a nightmare. I've given you as good a sample of Earth's life as is possible in a single day. You've seen much of North America, but it's worse elsewhere. Why, in Asia... Oh, please, please, Mr. McLellan, no more statistics. You've made your point over and over again. I'm sorry if I've tired you. But I wanted to show you the contrast between Earth and your own uncrowded planets. And now I appeal to you, Mr. Rockwood, in the name of the humanity that's common to all our worlds. You want us to let you send overflow masses to us. But we built those colonies as a safety valve for overpopulation. But now that we need to use that valve, it's shut tight. Mr. Rockwood, I'm a reasonable man. I know we're asking something that amounts to an imposition, but I beg you... I agree. Earth is terribly overcrowded. The population of Venus is about 700 million. Mars has about a billion... Callisto, 300 million. Now, these figures are close to the peak of optimum population. And since our death rates are low, thanks to medical advances, we have to keep a careful watch over birth rates to maintain normal population distribution. I ask you well, to let... Now, hear me out, please. We're deeply moved and sympathetic to your plight. We wish we could help you. We feel pity. The pity we would have for... Uh, well, for an idiot who, given a loaded gun, proceeds to blow his brains out. What did you say? I knew how overcrowded Earth was before I took your little tour. But we haven't grown overcrowded and won't. Why? Because we have small worlds, smaller than Earth. We can't allow ourselves to breed at Earth's rate. We see the inescapable need for certain self-restrictions. You don't see the moral obligation to accept some of our excess people? We see a moral obligation to refuse. To force you to see your real problem and its solution. I am empowered by the General Assembly, Mr. Rockwood, to exert any means within my power to make you change your mind. And Earth, I'm afraid, has more armed vessels than your three worlds combined. So you're threatening war? Not war. Survival. You have country estates, rolling green fields, and we don't have an inch of free space. So you'll fight to make us let you in. <laughs> you're bigger fools than I thought. Fourteen billion of you crammed onto one world, and a mere two billion of us scattered over three. 
Why, a war would ruin you. We'd bomb you in a shotgun spray and knock off a hundred thousand no matter where we struck. While you'd have to pry us out of nooks and crannies. We'd lose perhaps a hundred million people, but you'd lose billions. <laughs> I think we could risk it. So you won't yield. You'd risk war, even. You won't take colonists. When we colonize the stars, we shall do it differently. The stars? <laughs> yes, you're counting on them as your last hope. Hmm? But do you seriously think colonizing the stars can help your population problem? Hmm? Oh, look, Mr. McClellan, even if you invented a workable star drive tomorrow, it would take five years before the first ships got off the ground. You're adding 500,000 a day. Now, how many people would these ships hold? A thousand each? With 500,000 new births a day, you wouldn't be able to ship people to the stars fast enough to keep up. The math's against you, sir. You'd have to run as fast as you could just to stay where you are. Well, I suppose there's no further negotiation we can do, Mr. Rockwood. I'll arrange for your immediate return to your home planet. Now, will you think about what I've said? I'll think about it, yes. But we have 14 billion people on Earth. Mr. McClellan, we're not anxious for war. But your threat doesn't scare us either. We'll fight to defend our way of life. And we'll win, sir. Good day, Mr. McClellan. <laughs> human enough to want to pass his troubles along to another person. In this case, he wanted to make it that his troubles were because the colonists wouldn't let people emigrate. That wasn't the trouble. The trouble was emigration had become impossible. And that was the thing that he had to accept. And like the king in the biblical story, he didn't want that interpretation of the handwriting on the computer. Sit down, Bernie. Tell me how this star drive of yours is coming. I think we've got it licked, Lester. But you tell me how the colony's going to open up. No. No? But they can't do that. They just can't clam up and refuse to take in Earthmen. Well, Lester, we built those colonies. They don't have the right... I want to talk about the star drive, Bernie. How close to finished is it? Well, we, we haven't fully worked out the field equations yet. But with some fast computer work... I'm not interested in equations. How long do you think it'll be before Earth has spaceships that can travel faster than the speed of light, fast enough to reach the stars? Well, I told you before, Lester. Maybe a month, maybe two months. Till the pilot model is finished, that is. No more than a year, certainly. I had some very interesting figures thrown at me today. Have you ever realized how many ships we'd need to send out before we can even make a dent in our population? Hundreds a day. Well, even so, it would help some to get... No, rid no, it wouldn't. Bernie, I want you to do me a favor. When you perfected your new star drive, hide it. Don't destroy it, because we'll need it someday, but sit on it. Put the schematics away until I give the word and don't publish your findings. Have you gone crazy, Lester? No, I've suddenly gone stark, raving sane. Look, the new star drive is a dodge, a subterfuge. It's a substitute for the real answer to our problem, Bernie. Venus is not overcrowded. Their controlling population increase there. What does all this have to do with my star drive? Why should I stop work on it? Because it will cloud the issue. The people won't believe the figures. As long as there's what seems to be a way out, they'll cling to it. If you suppress the star drive, there'll be no way out at all. And Earth either cracks wide open or it grows up. There's no middle course. And you're suggesting that I deliberately destroy my life's work? Just for a while. Sure, it's a great thing to explore the stars, but first we need to control ourselves. If the world learns that there's a star drive, they'll think it's a way out. It isn't, but we'll ever convince them of it. 
First, we set up our population control programs, make them see the need for them, get them into operation, and then reveal the existence of the drive. We may have to wait a generation. No. No, I absolutely refuse. You can't meddle with science this way, Lester. Research must continue. If you interfere with me this way, well, I'll have no choice but to resign. Your resignation is accepted, Bernie. Effective immediately. What? But, but I only meant that it... I'm sorry, Bernie. So you're actually firing me? If you want to call it that. You don't want to understand how disastrous it would be to continue work on the star drive, okay. Your successor will be a man who will understand such things. Maybe he won't be as gifted as you are, Bernie, but that's all right. The stars can wait. Lester, you can't fire me like this. So cold-bloodedly, so, so ruthlessly. We've been friends for years. You think I don't know that. But all along, I've been soft-hearted, been making concessions, taking the easy way out. We farmed the seas. We colonized three worlds. We cleared away half the Antarctic ice pack to make new land. All big, important things, but all dodging the real issue. Now, I'm backed against the wall. The whole world is. I can't be soft-hearted anymore. Lester, this doesn't sound like you. I know, I know. You think I like the spot I'm in now? But a new order has to come about. An order which demands strength, tough-mindedness, courage. It's either that or a situation I don't want to think about. I can't let anything stand in the way now. Do I have time to clear out my office? can have until tomorrow. And remember that you're still bound by security regulations in case you plan to scream to the news sheets. I'll remember it. So long, Lester. Good luck. Thanks. I'm probably going to need it. Limitations, limitations even to what science can accomplish, the highest technology. The fundamental physical limitation of the amount of matter there is in the universe. Old Malthus was right. With a higher technology, you can push the limit out a little further, but not beyond the limits of the universe. They're fundamental. It comes necessary sooner or later to go in for quality instead of quantity. Not for numbers, but for fineness. Not for bigger, but for better. That's the direction we've got to go. Oh.